Most of Week 10 is in the books, and it started back on Thursday night with a game between the Bengals and Ravens. This was one of the best games of the season, and I think this is one of the best rivalries we have in football at the moment. Baltimore won with a score of 35-34, to and it was a real shame for Bengals fans because this was a once-every-few-seasons type game from Jamar Chase, only for it to result in a loss. I know Bengals fans were rightfully upset with no calls on the final play, but guys, look at what Joe Burrow and Jamar did in this game before it got to that that point. It should have never came down to one final play, and when your number one receiver has 264 yards and three touchdowns, hot take I know, but you should win that game no matter what. I really don't see a scenario where since he goes far in the playoffs because of how woeful their defense is. They are more or less out of the division race, and winning three road playoff games in this conference is a near impossible task, especially without a viable defense. Lamar Jackson, and also Joe Burrow for that matter, are both playing at an MVP level. Lamar has 24 touchdowns to two interceptions along with a career high in passer rating and completion percentage, and that starts to show the type of year he's having. Now, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't concerned about their defense because I absolutely am. Enjoy this win and the sweep of the Bengals, and know there is a very good possibility you have a three-time league MVP quarterback on your roster, but this defense scares me, especially when they get to the postseason. The Panthers beat the Giants in Germany with a score of 20-17 and have their first win streak since all the way back in November of 2022. Chuba Hubbard was extended this past week and ran for over 150 yards and a touchdown in this game and had his third 100-yard rushing game of the season. And this stat is for Panthers fans, but because of the fumble forced in overtime and the fact the Panthers won on that drive in overtime, that technically is a game-winning drive for Bryce Young. Any win at this point is big for Carolina to build confidence moving forward, even even as ugly of a win as this was. The defense forced three turnovers and held the Giants to 17 total points, and an ugly win is still a win. No huge takeaways for Carolina, but any win, and especially a winning streak, is welcomed at this point. Daniel Jones was 6 of 14 for 54 yards and an interception in the first half, and if there's anything to celebrate for the Giants, it's that the countdown for Daniel Jones not being the team's quarterback is on. I know the overtime fumble for Tyrone Tracy was frustrating, but I'd rather him get those mistakes out now in a year that doesn't matter, and in a year where they're not going anywhere. He is clearly a draft hit by GM Joe Shane and is a player to build around. There is a lot of bad football being played right now, and there's a lot of bad football teams right now, and losing to the Panthers could easily prove to be more beneficial in the long run. The Saints defeated the Falcons with a score of 20-17 and avoided the season sweep from the Atlanta Falcons. Marquez Valdez-Scantling had over 100 yards and two touchdowns, and some are wondering if Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen held him back. The Saints also snapped their seven-game losing streak after firing Dennis Allen, and any time a team fires a head coach, no matter who they're playing the next week, I'm never surprised if they win the first game after the previous coach is fired. I don't think the Saints are going to the playoffs with Darren Rizzi, and I know some fans will probably be a little annoyed with the win when it comes to draft position in April, but beating your arch rival is always a great day. This was a game of missed opportunity for the Falcons. They had 465 yards of offense, yet put up just 17 points. They had four fourth quarter possessions and they were a punt, a missed field goal, which was Young Way Koo's third missed field goal of the day, an interception, and a turnover on downs. I didn't think Atlanta was going to win the Super Bowl prior to this game, and I don't think they're going to win after this game, but what a truly frustrating loss that was very, very winnable. For anyone who likes to make the Falcons jokes, this was a game for you. And an entirely preventable loss. The 49ers flew across the country to defeat Tampa 23-20, and there's two things I'd like to say right off the bat. I'm happy for Ricky Pearsall after what happened a few months ago, and for him to score his first career touchdown in this game was an awesome moment. I'm also not surprised Christian McCaffrey had a slow start back after playing his first game of the year in Week 10. Jawan Jennings also played really well in this game, but 49ers fans know they flirted and flirted and flirted with losing this game. Jake Moody was 3 of 6 on field goals, and I do have concerns with this team's ability to get the ball into the end zone, and we saw what happened when they played a good defense. San Francisco has a lot of talent, obviously, but my big concern with them is finishing drives when it matters. 
My big takeaway for the Bucks is one I've had all year and why I can't commit to fully buying in with this team. Not playing to win from Todd Bowles is incredibly frustrating, and we saw it on Monday night against the Chiefs, and we saw it in this game too. And it's a shame because there's a reality where Tampa could be 6-4, and four, with Mike Evans coming back soon and a potential playoff run. Their schedule isn't too difficult coming up, but I don't trust this team to win three straight road games to get to the Super Bowl if it came down to that. The Bills went into Indy and took care of business 30-20, and I was glad to see this for Buffalo because I thought this had the potential to be a trap game as they play the Chiefs next week. Josh Allen has been playing at an MVP level all year, although this game was far from the level we've seen Josh play for most of the year. It certainly helped that Joe Flacco threw a pick six early in this game, and even threw two more interceptions after that, but again, anytime you put up 30 points on the road, it's hard to be disappointed. The Bills are 8-2 in a a year where they're supposed to be rebuilding and in a transition gear, and while they don't technically have the AFC East locked up, I will go on a limb here and say they're going to be division champions. This game was the 2024 Colts experience. They lost to a better team, they looked really bad at times, and they couldn't overcome their mistakes. I have a lot of questions as to where this franchise is headed because Indy's next two games are against the Jets and Lions, and I don't think putting Anthony Richardson back in against those teams would be setting him up for any sort of success. And right now, with the team being 4-6 and six and probably selecting outside the top 5 of the 2025 draft, this situation is a nightmare. Speaking of nightmares, the Patriots defeated the Bears 19-3, and we'll get to the Bears in a second. New England looked a lot better in this game, and when Drake May plays confident, it's scary for the opponent. We obviously know the supporting cast isn't great for him at the moment, but I really believe the flashes are there, and I really like what I see from him. And for the sake of Drake, it was also nice to see the ground game get going against the Bears, as they ran for over 140 yards as an offense. A couple of weeks ago, the Patriots had something insane like 15 non-Drake May manufactured yards, but they looked a lot better against a good defense in Week 10. The Bears have never fired a coach mid-season, but after this, it has to change. If they want to prove this time is any different than the Mitch or the Justin Fields era, Eberflus has to go. This was embarrassing for the Bears and their fan base. Caleb Williams was sacked nine times in this game, and you're not going to succeed like that with any quarterback. Obviously, Caleb also has to play better, but this is exactly what I feared from the Bears by keeping Matt Eberflus last offseason. And to nobody's surprise, this situation is a complete and utter disaster. Matt Eberflus has to go. The Minnesota Vikings beat the Jags with a score of 12-7, and if you look in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary right next to the word ugly win, this game will appear. There was a point deep into the second half where Minnesota had more plays in Jacksonville's territory than Jacksonville had offensive plays. Minnesota had over 42 minutes time of possession, which was the most of any team all year. They ran 82 plays to Jacksonville's 43, and they outgained them 402 to 143. This game should not have been close but it was because of Sam Darnold's turnovers. If you watched this game, my concerns for the Vikings and why I made a video on them struggling a few weeks ago were evident all throughout. This is not a win against a good team, and they narrowly escaped North Florida with a win. The Trayvon Walker incident at the end for the Jags is peak losing football. I know they were outplayed in this game in a big way, but to not have a chance to get the ball back because of a completely preventable penalty summarizes the 2024 Jags. There's a reason they're 2-8, and eight, and I wouldn't be surprised with how this game ended if Doug Peterson is fired on Monday morning while you were watching this video. I should clarify, the Jags defense was great in this game as they only allowed 12 points and over 400 yards and forced multiple turnovers, especially when their offense didn't do anything to help them, and I mean anything at all. The Jags season was already over, but this game shows how much Trevor Lawrence carries this football team. The Chiefs somehow, someway survived another game as they won on a blocked field goal 16-14. Like a lot of Chiefs wins this year, it was by no means a pretty win, yet they improved to 9-0. I understand everyone getting frustrated with how the Chiefs win these games, and some people are calling them a fraudulent team, and that at some point they're going to get their rear ends kicked. Again, these are others' words, not mine. Some seem to think it's going to be next week against the Bills, but until Kansas City gets beat, I still think they are the favorites to go to the Super Bowl from the AFC, and this was the the third straight game where the Chiefs didn't allow 300 yards of opposing offense. They've only allowed 300 yards or more once in the past six games. 
Denver fell to 5-5 five and five with this loss, and I know this one in particular stinks, and I don't know what else to say to a fan base that lost in this manner. Because, let's just face this, Broncos fans don't want to hear about, hey, you're doing better than you were supposed to entering the year, especially when you came this close to beating the Chiefs. If I have any takeaway for Denver, it's that I really like their future and their upcoming schedule isn't too difficult, and they can win anywhere from 8-10 to 10 games. Pittsburgh defeated Washington 28-27 in what was a very good game. And this game had everything, from George Pickens scoring and getting into a scuffle with Mike Sanra still to his jumping stiff arm, and from Mike Williams having the best first catch he could have asked for as a stealer and more. Pittsburgh did a great job in defending Jaden Daniels, and they held the Commanders to just 242 yards of offense, and made a few mistakes that I thought would come back to bite them, but ultimately did not. This was a hell of a game to win coming off the bye, and it was the first game of the gauntlet schedule the Steelers have. They play Baltimore next week, and if their defense can play the way they have like they did in this game, then it will be time to fully buy in with the Steelers. Washington dropped several passes in this game, and I know the Johnny Newton offsides penalty at the end was the final nail in the coffin, but they didn't lose because of that penalty. Washington's receivers, outside of Terry McLaurin, combined for just 51 yards on 16 targets, and you are not going to win games like that, especially against good teams, and especially against a great defense. They play Philly on Thursday, and they can win, and it's certainly not going to be easy, but with the amount of mental mistakes Washington made in this game, they can and improved to 8 and 3 on Thursday. The Chargers beat the Titans 27-17, and this game wasn't as close as a 10-point final would indicate. The Chargers had an opening drive field goal to which Tennessee countered with an opening touchdown drive of their own, but they would score a single field goal until there was less than a minute to play when Will Levis threw a touchdown pass to Calvin Ridley in what was, by every definition, garbage time. There's not a lot to say that we did know about this team prior to the game, and the Titans fared about as well as I expected them against a Jesse Minter defense. Levis was sacked seven times, and a bad offense went against a great defense and couldn't outscore the opponent. That summarizes a lot of the 2024 Titans, and unfortunately it summarizes this game. This is the fifth double-digit win of the season for the Chargers, and this was everything I was hoping for when they hired Jim Harbaugh. The floor is raised in the Chargers, for lack of better wording, aren't having many Charger games like they had during the Anthony Lynn and Brandon Staley era. This was their third straight double-digit win, and I am looking forward to next Sunday night when they play the Cincinnati Bengals. The Philadelphia Eagles dismantled the Dallas Cowboys 34-6, and they held them to 146 yards of total offense. Yes, I know Dak Prescott didn't play in this game, but this type of game is what we've seen all year from the Cowboys. Dating back to the wildcard game of last year, they now have a minus 110 point difference in their last five home games, and this situation is a complete disaster. There's not a lot of positive things to say. You can tell by watching this team every week that they are mentally checked out, and I don't blame them. Their coach isn't good, their owner is obviously a whole other problem in itself, and they're not a good team. Yes, they have injuries, but this is a truly defeated football team. Philly took care of a bad team, and they didn't sustain any injuries in the process, and the cherry on top was they embarrassed a division rival. I know everyone thought Philly was going to win this game, but it always feels good to embarrass a division rival in their stadium when you can, because that opportunity doesn't come around often. I don't have any really big takeaways for either side, as I do think Philly is one of the best teams in the NFC, while Dallas is one of the worst teams in the NFC, especially without Dak Prescott. The big surprise of the day wasn't the Cardinals beating the Jets, it was the Cardinals beating the Jets by 25 points. Every so often, Kyler Murray has one of these hyper-efficient games where he only has a handful of incompletions, and this was certainly one of them. He finished the day 22 of 24 for 266 yards and had a passing touchdown, and the team ran for 147 yards. Arizona has won four in a row, and I am very happy for them, but I don't want this to be the game where we completely over react and crown them and think they are the next team up. I want them to do well, but their next three games are going to be telling as to what we can expect out of them for the remainder of 2024. The Jets allowed over 400 yards of offense and had just 207 yards of their own offense in this game, and this was a disaster. Garrett Wilson and Devontae Adams had a combined 19 targets and together hauled in 11 receptions for 72 yards. Tyron Smith looked awful at times on the left side of the line, and this was the culmination of the Jets' 2024 season in one game. To anyone who missed this game, it was sad for Jets fans to have to go through this. This is not a normal bad team. 
This is a franchise that hasn't been to the postseason in 14 years that went all in and was hoping for a year and a half that a 40-year-old quarterback would fix everything, and there's times where he looks like the MVP Aaron Rodgers, but more often than not, he doesn't. And this is one of the worst situations in football at the moment because I don't think it's an exaggeration to say the locker room has never been lower than after this loss. I truly don't know where the Jets go from here. I hope you enjoyed and if you did, please like and subscribe as only about 44% of people watching are subscribed. And guys, we are closing in on 175,000 subs and I cannot thank you guys enough for the support. Until next time, please be safe and have a great day. Love you guys.